I'm Pat Garrity, an instructor in a two-year MLT program with a lot of years of experience in looking at urine. And I'm Jerry Walters, supervisor of a clinical laboratory. I too have looked at my share of urines more than I ever cared to. Testing urine is one of the oldest laboratory procedures around. And as with so many things, it is taking us a long time to eliminate the ancient tests no longer of value in the technological laboratory of today. As far back as 400 BC, urine is mentioned as an aid to diagnosis. By the 16th century, examination of urine had evolved, or perhaps degraded is a better term, to the lucrative practice of uromancy. The examination of urine in those days was the domain of pissy prophets. It is now done in the clinical laboratory, so I guess you could call us present day pissy prophets. In this video, we are going to discuss the when, what, and how of performing urine microscopic examinations. The when of performing microscopics is an important issue in today's busy laboratory. Microscopics should be performed only on those urines that have been screened macroscopically. To properly screen macroscopically, a dipstick with all the chemical tests should be used. If the chemical testing is positive for any of the following list, then a microscopic should be performed. These chemicals are blood, protein, leukocyte esterase, and nitrites. If the other chemicals tested for, such as ketones, glucose, bilirubin, or urobilinogen are positive, without any of the other ones being positive, then a microscopic would not be appropriate. Of course, if a physician specifically insists on a urine microscopic, one should be performed. The other macroscopic characteristics, such as color, pH, and specific gravity are not used in most screening protocols. You gain nothing by looking at urine merely because the specific gravity is high or low. The clarity or turbidity of the urine is another issue. Many people perform microscopics on urines with negative chemical screens merely because they're turbid or cloudy. We think you need to evaluate this in your institution for your patient population. In our experience, if the only abnormality is a cloudy urine, the probability of finding clinically significant elements in the microscopic examination are minimal. Now, in the what section, we will do a quick review of the common elements seen on routine microscopic examination of urine. The first structures we will look at are red blood cells. In this slide, we see many red blood cells using routine light microscopy. In this slide, we see many red blood cells under phase microscopy. You certainly can see the advantage of using a phase microscope. The elements are much more obvious. During this section, some of the slides we will show you will be from phase, while others will be from routine light microscopy. There are a very few red blood cells seen in this slide. It would certainly be more difficult to see these without using phase. In this slide, under high power phase, we see something that is frequently missed under bright field. That is, ghost red blood cells. Without phase, the numbers reported would not be as accurate because of all the missed ghost cells. We will not address dysmorphic red blood cells since their evaluation is not a routine observation. Now we'll look at some white cells. In this slide, there are quite a few seen, again under high power phase. In this slide, under phase, you can see three white blood cells and a single red blood cell. You can see the obvious difference between red blood cells and white blood cells. In this slide, there are lots of white blood cells, and although we are not there yet, there is also a significant amount of bacteria. This combination is pretty common. Let's look at some epithelial cells. There are three types that need to be recognized and reported squamous, renal, and transitional. The first are squamous epithelial cells that you see in this slide. This is a low power view under phase. This is a higher power view of squamous epithelial cells. They are large, irregularly shaped cells with a small nucleus. It is not a significant finding to see these cells in sheets or clusters. This is what squamous epithelial cells look like on Brightfield. The second type of epithelial cell that should be differentiated is the transitional epithelial cell. Transitional cells have a more central nucleus 
and are smaller and more rounded than squamous cells. This slide is bright field under high power. This phase view shows what they look like in combination. These are the large squamous epithelial cells. The transitional epithelial cells are round, significantly smaller, with a centrally placed nucleus. Another type of transitional epithelial cell are these caudate-shaped cells seen under phase. They have the same significance as other transitional cells. They merely come from a different part of the urinary tract. The third type of epithelial cell to be differentiated is renal tubular cells as seen here. This slide is bright field under high power. It is sometimes difficult to separate these from transitional cells. These cells are pretty much the same size as transitional cells, but have an eccentric, obvious nucleus and a square rather than round shape. Now we're going to look at other stuff, things that are not always cellular in nature. We will begin with casts. Although we cannot show you every kind, we have included several different types. In this slide, under low power phase, we see a hyaline cast. This is a hyaline cast under high power phase. Although the cast appears to include a minimal amount of debris, it is still classified as a hyaline. In this bright field view, believe it or not, there's supposed to be a cast. It's right here. No, 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 no. It's right over here. No, it's over there. Okay, maybe here. Are you done? Yes. Oh, wait, it's on my glasses. Now it's right here. Oops. Never mind. Highland casts are notoriously difficult to see on bright field. This again emphasizes the need for phase microscopy. In this slide, there is a granular cast under bright field microscopy. The degree of granularity is not important and subjective at best. In this slide, we see a red blood cell cast under high power phase microscopy. These are a very important finding and therefore should never be missed. These are a rare but significant abnormality associated with renal disease. In this slide, we see a waxy cast, which is the other significant occurrence associated with renal disease. This is under high power phase. Now we're going to look at some other stuff. In this slide, we see both mucus and cylindroids under phase microscopy. These findings are hard to see with bright field. There's also a calcium oxalate crystal on this slide showing the typical star pattern. This is a calcium oxalate crystal under a higher power on phase and bright field. Let's look at a couple of other commonly seen crystals. Calcium oxalate crystals are associated with acid urines. And these triplophosphate crystals are associated with alkaline urines. Another crystal seen in acid urine is uric acid, which you see here. There's also a nice view of a cylindroid, which Pat just talked about. It looks like a hyaline cast with a tail, which it is. In this slide, we see several hyaline casts and cylindroids, along with what we now call amorphous material. This amorphous material is small crystal debris. In the old days, we used to distinguish amorphous urates from amorphous phosphates based on the pH of the urine they were found in. Who cares? It is sufficient to report amorphous material. Something that might look like amorphous material, if you are not up close and careful, is bacteria. In this slide, we see a significant amount of bacteria under high power phase. A few of these are refractile, like very small amorphous crystals. Another microorganism seen in urines is yeast. As you can see from this slide, it is sometimes difficult to separate yeast from other elements. The sample shown under high power phase has both budding yeast as well as red blood cells and white blood cells. If you cannot tell the yeast from the red blood cells, it might be helpful to add a small amount of dilute acetic acid to your slide and see what disappears. The red blood cells will lyse and the yeast will remain. Another finding not uncommon when yeast is present is hyphae. Hyphae is a significant finding. This is a phase view. And this is what hyphae looks like under bright field. Trichomonas, seen here under high power phase, can look very much like a white blood cell. Most of us, when suspicious, search until we find a modal flagella. Since these are not modal flagella, we will point them out. Or you can shake your TV screen. 
The last item we're showing you is sperm, which you see here under high power phase. In the house section, we're going to address a way to standardize the reporting of various elements we just saw. Even with these recommendations, there are still going to be many variables and results obtained because of the constantly changing characteristics of urine due to the patient's hydration status and the time of day. The first variable is the volume of urine collected. The minimum recommended volume for adequate analysis is 12 mL. The preferred volume is 50 mL. There are also changes which occur in urine depending on how the sample was handled. Time is a big factor in urine microscopic exams. The standard of the industry says a urine microscopic exam should be performed within two hours of sample collection, unless the sample is refrigerated or otherwise preserved. There are commercially available preservatives. Standardization of the technique used in concentrating the specimen is important. A constant amount of urine should be centrifuged on each patient. The recommendation is 10, 12, or 15 mLs. The centrifugal force should also be constant. The recommendation is a relative centrifugal force of 400 for five minutes. Once the urine is centrifuged, a constant amount of urine must be decanted, always leaving the same volume of sediment. There are tubes commercially available that will aid in standardizing the volume. The volume placed on the slide should be a standard amount. Using a slide designed with a constant depth and area is helpful. If these are not used, then the standard dropper with a constant volume should be used. A minimum of 10 low power and 10 high power fields should be examined. There are inexpensive ocular inserts that may be used to divide the microscopic field into quarters. These inserts help in enumerating cells, especially when you have a lot. As you can tell, we strongly recommend the use of phase microscopy. In the past, the oldest microscope in the lab was placed in the urine laboratory when new ones were purchased. If possible, having a quality microscope with phase capabilities helps in the performance of microscopics. If you do not use phase microscopy, it is helpful to use one of the many urine stains commercially available. In your documentation is a chart to use to standardize urine microscopic reporting. Under low power magnification, 10x casts, including cylindroids, should be viewed and counted, even though you may have to resort to a high power to identify them. Under high power, either 40 or 50x, all other elements should be viewed. Of course, when under low power, you can get a preview of what's to be seen under higher magnification. There are some things that do not need to be counted, but should be reported as present. Their significance is in their presence, not in their quantity. The following elements are reported as present. Mucus, sperm, trichomonas, crystals and their type, yeast as well as hyphae, and bacteria. Since some of these, such as bacteria and yeast, depend on sample collection and age, it can be misleading to try to quantitate them. For your institution, you may want to semi-quantitate bacteria as minimal amount present or large amount present. Some laboratories have many different ranges for reporting, while other laboratories allow the microscopist to create any ranges they choose. The numerical criteria we recommend is simple to use, clinically significant, and the same for both low and high power. It is none seen, 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 25, 25 to 100, and greater than 100. This grading system is used for casts under low power and red blood cells, white blood cells, and epithelial cells under high power. Here is an example of how it works. If this were one microscopic field and all 10 fields looked identical, you would report 10 to 25 red blood cells per high power field. There are definitely 12 red blood cells in this field with a couple of questionables, which could be confirmed with fine adjustment. When you have numerous cells, you can see the advantage of using the crosshair ocular. If this were your microscopic field, you would count the number of cells in a quarter of the field. In this example, there are more than 25 red blood cells in a quarter of the field. Once you reach 25, you can stop counting and move on to the next field. The maximum range is greater than 100. and is not necessary to count beyond this. If all your fields looked like this one, you would report greater than 100 RBCs per high power field. 
after examining 10 fields, of course. And that's numbers the old way. There's a movement afoot to report urine microscopics in a more quantitative fashion than our current ranges. Some standards suggest reporting microscopic elements as number per milliliter. Others are recommending numbers per microliter. There is a worksheet in your documentation to use to convert your system to either milliliter or microliter. We do not recommend doing this for manual microscopic testing. It is cumbersome, time consuming, and therefore expensive. And considering all the variables in manual testing, the result is certainly not worth the effort. However, automation is finally catching up with your analysis. One advantage of the automation available is the elimination of specimen concentration variables. The analysis is performed on whole urine, which may be a funny term, but we perform our analyses in hematology on whole blood. One instrument you may be familiar with is the iris, which identifies microscopic elements by pattern recognition. There is some tech interaction required, but the fact that it is automated controls many of the variables seen in the manual method. The results can accurately be converted to volumetric results. Another instrument is the Sysmix UF100, which performs quantitative microscopic analysis utilizing fluorescence and flow cytometry. This technology does not require routine tech intervention. The results are reported per microliter. Since these two instruments indicate the wave of the near future, the prospect of other automated instruments exists. It's about time automation caught up with your analysis, but therein lies our next problem. As is our habit, we're going to try to verify the performance of these instruments with the manual method, and it's not going to work. Even if you use the charts we gave you, there are too many variables. You could use a hemocytometer and exactly measured volumes and maybe come close. But personally, if I saw a lot of red cells and the instrument saw a lot of red cells, I would trust the instrument. It is looking at far more volume and counting greater numbers than we can manually. It is more important to make sure the instrument recognizes all the clinically significant elements. For the present, most of us will have to muddle through with manual methods. We hope the information we've given you will help you standardize the process. After all, we don't want to be known as pissy profits forever. It sounds like we're making things up. And we're not. No, we're not. Thanks for listening.